and welcome. You've tuned in to JSA TV, the newsroom for tech and telecom professionals, and JSA Radio, your voice for tech and telecom on iHeartRadio. I'm Barb Mitchell, and on behalf of my team here at JSA, welcome to our monthly virtual CEO roundtable. Our virtual roundtables uh, lead us up to our on-site CEO roundtables at our CEO level networking event, the Telecom Exchange. Our next one, of course, is coming up, uh, Tex LA in Beverly Hills, November 11th and 12th, and following that uh, in um, New York uh, in May. So you can find out more about that at thetelecomexchange.com. Let's get started today. We have a fantastic roundup um, of ladies from the industry talking about our topic, which is, of course, a spotlight on women in tech, uh, the evolution of the tech and telecom industry. Today, we're talking to top leaders in the tech and telecom industry about the latest trends that they are seeing. Uh, in addition, we'll, of course, have the opportunity to discuss how influential women are helping shape the future of the tech and telecom industry. Also, we'll talk about what role these ladies uh, and other uh, influential women in their organizations and organizations that they are seeing uh, have played in, in supporting these advancements. So it's my pleasure now to introduce you to our group of panelists today. We have Christine Van Slyke, Vice President, Sales, Marketing and Business Development at Scalable Technologies. Lisa Williams, Senior Manager, Carrier Sales and Marketing at DQE Communications. Mary T, Sales Manager at East Structure Data Centers. Mary Morgan, Vice President, Marketing at Stream Data Centers. Ladies, welcome. Thank you so much uh, for participating in this today. Uh, why don't we start by having you tell us a little bit about yourself and your company. Christine, do you want to go ahead and start? Sure. So I've been in telecommunications for 15 plus years, seeing lots of changes over that time and continue to. Uh, scalable Network Technologies provides a network simulation platform or network digital twin that actually allows organizations or helps organizations manage and optimize their networks, whether they're looking to introduce new technologies or applications, or more critical now is to evaluate and plan for the impact of cyber attacks. Some of the areas that we're focused in on are critical infrastructure, automotive, telecommunications, and defense, which is our largest customer overall. Thank you. Lisa? Thank you. Hi, I'm Lisa. Thank you, Barb. Good morning to all of you ladies. Um, I am with a company called DQE Communications. I lead the carrier sales and marketing team here, and we are a regional fiber network provider that has been in the business for over 20 years. Headquartered here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, we build and operate our own fiber network to provide data solutions. So, uh, in solutions such as Ethernet, Internet, dark fiber, um, to the businesses and carriers, actually, that need to connect to multiple offices, maybe the Internet data centers or even access to cloud services. We also provide wireless backhaul and small cell connections for the wireless network that we all use every day. Um, we, even though we are headquartered in Pittsburgh and we started here as a company, we are a regional fiber provider that uh, continues to expand our fiber network so that we can provide our services um, out there more regionally. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Uh, Mary T. Good morning, ladies. Uh, happy to be able to chat with you all this morning. So I'm Mary. I'm the regional sales manager at uh, eStructure Data Centers. So eStructure is a Canadian network and client neutral data center provider uh, with six facilities across three different uh, markets. Three data centers in Montreal. We have also two in Vancouver and one in Calgary for a total of 360,000 square feet of combined data center space. Well, not quite done yet because it is part of the company strategy to add additional uh, dots in the Canadian map. So we are focused on building hyperscale facility where we target high density customers with cabinet going up to 30 uh, KW. And of course, we also accommodate the customer with lower density as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Mary Morgan. Yeah, thanks for having me and um, hello everyone. 
Uh, I'm with Stream Data Centers in charge of marketing. Uh, Stream is celebrating our 20th anniversary this year uh, in the technical real estate space. We're part of a larger uh, corporate enterprise called Stream Realty Partners. We have offices in 14 markets with over 850 employees. And our data center division is uh, laser focused on delivering best in class hyperscale data centers, private data centers, ready to fit powered shells, pretty much turnkey data center development, um, in addition to a list of mission critical services that support all data center environments and managed owned and other facilities. Um, it's a really exciting time to be here. It's a great company. Um, prior to this, I was also in the data center business for three years and prior to that, eight years in semiconductor. So I've seen some interesting things over the course of my, um, it's a good time to be in data centers. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, thank you uh, everyone for that introduction. Why don't we jump right into our topic today? Uh, and you know, there's been so much conversation um, lately and really over the past several years, it feels like, it, you know, the the um, energy around this is growing and growing, but um, you know, as we you know as we start to get into a topic around things like diversity and inclusion and and women in tech and supporting that, I think it's always nice to start with what's driving that. And so, you know, our first question that we wanted to explore today as a group was just a perspective on the developments and trends that uh, you're seeing in the industry, specifically as it re relates to your organization. And Christine, if you wouldn't mind. Um, leading on this question would be great. Sure, sure, thank you. Uh, so the trends that we're focusing in on and uh, sort of watching, they're kind of interrelated, but it's around cybersecurity, uh, digital twin technology, and also IoT overall, and just the increase of IoT devices and sensors in the many different uh, verticals, and then of course the potential vulnerabilities attached. So we're seeing, and I think everyone's seeing, and you see something in the news every day, but cyber attacks are increasing, the cost of cyber attacks are increasing, and there really needs to be something organizations to, can do to help plan for the impact of these cyber attacks. Just to give some numbers, I was looking at a report recently where it had gone up to, I think, 14 million as an average for an organization. For financial services, it's about 40% year over year increase. So one of the things we're looking at and what we provide is the network digital twin that's like a replica of your network. So it allows you to do that testing and plan for the impact of those cyber attacks and you know ensure that you have some type of mitigation plan in place. And so the final one, so the digital twin again is one area and the other is around IoT. You know, they're looking at, I think in 2020, it's going to go up to 50 billion uh, devices out there. And, you know, there's lots of value to them, increased efficiency, productivity, but then it increases the attack vector uh, because these are wireless communications. One of the areas we focus in on is around the grids. So if you look at grids, they're remotely managed. Uh, you know, you have the potential of an attack coming in that affects the network, and then that can go into the uh, operational environment and like it did in the Ukraine as an example where it knocks out the power so in these areas we're very focused we think we can provide value and so we're just tracking what's happening in some of the developments in that area interesting it'll be interesting to talk more as we get further in the discussion about that um, and and in terms of you know how to resource against that and, and thinking of the the market as a whole um, yeah. and the impact um, Lisa do you want to jump in next so uh, what trends we're seeing here actually and in, in for our business is a lot of increasing bandwidth needs from the customers so you know what's a little surprising about that it's no surprise more people want to eat bandwidth up it's just surprising that the pace at which the bandwidth seems to be increasing right now it seems that like one gig requests are the new 100 meg and 10 gig and 100 gig requests anymore you know are becoming more the norm so you know a lot of this is driven by all the tech trends that continue to develop and evolve into the mainstream as christine mentioned iot 
So that's, you know, one of the things that it, are going to continue to drive this ban bandwidth increase. Um, and then some customers are just trying to prepare for the next big thing, whatever that is. But, you know, while the challenge of the bandwidth is increasing, the revenue growth, growth is not growing at the same rate, which is primarily due to the ongoing price compression that happens in our industry, right? So there's a lot of competition out there, but, you know, not all networks are created equally. So customers want the reliable, secure network that goes back again to what Christine was saying about cybersecurity. Everybody is worried about making sure that they have a secure network out there. So we have to make sure, how do we stand out, right? So DQE doesn't try to sell a one-size-fits-all solution. We look at each customer request or opportunity that comes in and we'll design the most efficient um, solution that fits their business needs. Since we own our fiber network, we have the flexibility to tailor a solution to that particular customer. So another thing we do for every customer order, we assign a dedicated project manager so that we ensure that the service is getting installed as the customer requested and to where the customer needs it to go. So we will extend to that customer suite as part of our service at no charge. And this is a huge differentiator from our competitors. We must only terminate at the minimum point of entry. But since we take it to the customer, we can then, you know, test our service, validate it, and it'll, you know, be, make sure it's all reliable. Thank you. Mary Jane, do you want to... Yeah, um, yeah, for sure. Um, I think that as an infrastructure provider, we're seeing the same trends mentioned by Christine and Lisa, but more pertinently to the data center space, I think we've realized in Canada here that a lot of the hyperscalers have finally realized that Canada is an interesting market for them because of climate, especially in regions such as Montreal, where we run on free cooling almost nine months uh, of the year. The cost of power is also among the lowest in North America. And given that a lot of those companies are backed by US investment, they benefit from a discount north of the 30% just by putting their data in, in Canada. And of course, we're seeing that uh, multi-megawatt deals continue to grow within the market. And those customers want the flexibility to scale to their needs in a timely fashion. And of course, AI is growing significantly here in Canada, especially in Montreal, where we have a huge pool of AI labs and an abundance of, of talent. AI machine learning applications are becoming a significant business di uh, differentiator for enterprise customers. Um, and they have very specific requirement as to how to safeguard uh, their data. So the security aspect continues to be a major requirement uh, within the data center space. So at eStructure, I mean, we, we try to continue to grow and build robust uh, facilities secure, staying secure and well connected so that we can address those needs uh, that we're seeing in the market right now. Thanks, Mary. It's, cer it's certainly been a pleasure to watch the growth of East Structure across Canada um, and, you know, resourcing all of those, the mm -hmm. growing uh, verticals that you mentioned. We're certainly um, not done. No, <laughs> we didn't think you were. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> we're excited to watch it. you keep continue your growth. Um, Mary Morgan? Well, I just can't help but think about the last couple of years with the whole hyperscale at hyperspeed being the mantra for data centers and how that's kind of morphed into uh, what do we do with edge and what do we do with um, facilities management and, and, and what I see happening there is a definite gravitation to hand-in-hand -hand partnerships where we as data set center developments are charged with partnering with these enterprise and cloud providers to um, really go forth with concierge level service on, on managed facilities, um, very personalized, very individualized data center deployments. And that need for speed conundrum is just morphing into more of a white glove service with layers of IoT, Edge, and still hyperscale at hyperspeed, but um, we're, we're doing a lot more with uh, individualized deployments and, and customization, so I think that will continue as we layer on more data, more space and power, and everything else. 
And since, um, why don't we continue, Mary, as we kind of move, if we move into the next question. You obviously, Stream has just um, been recognized by capacity uh, a couple of weeks ago in London at the, the first uh, Women in Tech and Telecom conference. Uh, so it's probably a good timing really to have this conversation and give you the opportunity to talk about when we think about all of these um, trends in the market, uh, the things that we're seeing in the industry, how is Stream responding to this and what does it mean for you as an organization? Um, I'm really proud of our team because women are leading significant areas of our business, but it's not contrived and it's not forced. It's just an organic mission we're on to deliver the best products and service for our customer. And oftentimes we find that women are able to deliver the, the best overall um, expertise to their area of, um, of the business. And so that's not to say um, there's a definite uh, mantra for inclusion and diversity. It just comes naturally here. Um, we are proud to be honored by Capacity, who for, it's the first year they've done gender or any kind of um, gender-like acknowledgements and we were elected best data center in the whole category because for instance last year 42 percent of our new hires were women that was not uh, mandated by any kind of um, requirement on our corporate team it was just that's who bubbled up to be the best fit and so we have women leading sales we have women leading marketing client service and we even have women out in the field um, in, in various capacities. So um, I, I, I attribute that to our partners. Um, they value diversity and perspectives and they like to color um, the customer offering with anything that's value add and that often comes from women. Uh, so regarding the award, we were honored regarding our corporate mantra. It's, very, it's a soft pedaled solution that's very customer driven and um, we will continue to, to be fair and equal in our workplace but it's certainly not contrived in any way. And Mary, Mary T, since we're on that topic, your CEO Todd Colbin was also recognized at that event in London mm -hmm. and for the work that he's done with the structure and bringing diversity and inclusion uh, to the team, the organization, and the industry, uh, and he actually spoke at the event. And maybe you can talk a little bit about your organization as well. Uh, absolutely. Well, first of all, uh, congratulations, Mary, for the award. Um, on our end, Todd has worked uh, a fair amount of, has put in a lot of effort into uh, the gender diversity into the workplace as well, and I'm very proud to work for such an organization. But um, on, on our end, when we look at the trends in the market and how we respond to that. I mean, I think it is fair to say that we need to think ahead and see how we can foresee and accommodate the market need of the future. I mean, at eStructure, we choose to partner um, with companies that can help us build uh, data centers uh, with upfront lead time um, that can accommodate customizable modular design and at the same time address the ever increasing uh, security standards that are asked by our customers. Um, as we know, two very important components of the data center industry is, of course, uh, space and power. If we look at our newest uh, data center in Montreal, we have carefully selected a site that can accommodate the need of the market today, but also has the flexibility to help us uh, grow in the future. Today, uh, our MTL2 facility has roughly about 187,000 square feet with the access of uh, 30 megawatts of power, but we are also sitting on 10 acres of land that we can use for future expansion. And our utility provider is also committed in providing additional uh, power for our future expansion plans. Um, years ago, data center were only concerned about the physical security, but today with AI cyber threats coming left and right at us, we need to be more vigilant as an organization in regards to the internet security of things. Um, in that sense, we, we have procedures in place to help maintain the operations um, of the data center, but at the same time to keep the customer's application up and running. 
Um, we're working with our partners, customers, and employees on how to address and react to that um, nowadays. Uh, we have someone at our organization who's practically 100% dedicated um, on network security, physical security of the data center. We provide training to our employees to make sure that the entire team is aware and know how to react to those uh, potential threats. And uh, of course, we're working with various intelligence a platform and experts to put in place new ways uh, to ensure security on that level. So that's how a little bit on how we're, we're handling the, the trends in the market. Thanks. Lisa or Christine, did you have anything you wanted to add on that? Sure, though, uh, Mary, I think we may be able to help you as you look at that uh, <laughs> cybersecurity challenge. I think uh, we've been investing millions of dollars in research and development in building that network uh, digital twin platform that provides that replica of your network to allow you to do uh, the testing you need to prepare for instances. Uh, part of our investment is, you know, ensuring the interfaces that we can interface with the network managers out there, mm -hmm. with, you know, applications, other simulators that organizations are using uh, to ensure that it actually is truly a replica. And so that, you know, they can have that uh, connecting to the live to see, okay, so in this situation, you know, what, what's happening here. And the other side of it is we also have a training platform that allows you to have organizations, um, you know, look at the network, uh, attack happens, do they notice it? How do they manage it? So there's a lot of investment on our side, just building that up and uh, ensuring ease of use. Uh, we actually invest in team uh, members that have the expertise required in this type of environment. And we're also partnering with organizations, actually uh, one in Montreal, Mary, uh, Opal RT. They're uh, focused on power simulation. So we bring the two of us together, the network and power, and it allows you to do the full uh, simulation of the IT and OT environment. So when there's an impact on the network, you can see on the operational side, you know, what the outcome is. So a lot of our time, uh, you know, in people and dollars is really invested about in trying to make that as solid and really truly, uh, you know, an example or a replica of the organization's network. Sounds like we've made a good pairing here. <laughs> um, Lisa, any final words on that? Um, sure. I mean, and in, in with our market trends, you know, we responded consistently in a couple different ways. You know, we're constantly expanding our fiber footprint and we go to where our customers need. So um, right now we're currently working on an expansion plan that's going to push our network out further to central PA and then build a, a nice metro network out there too. But this is based off of customer demand that we have seen. Um, and it's also, you know, with what we hear from our customers, we've recently launched an SD-WAN product to augment our Ethernet services. So, you know, we're always looking to add the next product and to, you know, partner with our vendors as well to see, okay, how, what, how can we come together to, you know, provide a good service for our customers. And we're consistently hiring. I mean, I, this company has grown from eight people when I started to now eight, over 80. I should say, and we're hiring in those other areas. So it's an exciting time, and a, it, but a busy one. Yeah. And, and since we have you speaking, maybe we can just jump right into our last question. We've got a few minutes left. Um, just to touch on, you know, really why diversity in leadership matters in the midst of all of this. And I'll let you jump in on that question. Oh, sure. Well, you know, we know diversity matters. Um, it brings a lot. <laughs> It, uh, you know, brings a lot more creativity, ideas, different perspectives. You know, it also enhances our employees' experiences, as well as our connection to our communities and the community and the customers in those communities. Um, you know, there are a lot of opportunities for women in tech. It's a matter of getting them to stay and get into the tech. You know, well, one of the few research reports I read stated that employment in STEM Occupations has grown 79% since 1990. Mm -hmm. It's great, but women are still underrepresented in engineering and computers and the physical science. So we need to, you know, bring bring them into this um, world that we live in. And and there's a couple different ways that, as my company, um, we're looking at trying to do it. We're, we're 
the right now being more intentional in our approach and um, you know starting with our existing workforce we we constantly educate but we're looking to do more with education training development we're going to create an employee resource group you know that can come together and focus on building different diverse inclusive engaged workforce this is you know across all um, different departments um, we want to continue to hire the top talent so you know how do we do that we're going to have to hire a wider net i'll say you know attract more candidates um, advertise in like non-traditional or not the mainstream job posting web search engines that everybody is you know else goes to you got to get creative on okay where are we going to find the women and the diverse candidates that we want um, and get all of the top talent for all of that you know for the stem we want to we need to start earlier um, and go out to the schools and educate in the stem field um, you know it's the it, you need to teach them what kind of job you can have what does it mean and yet what are the jobs out there that you can do um, it's part of our core values so you know our funding priorities for charitable giving supplier diversity it plays a part into all of that um, we actually recently this year created a new position in our organization for the first time a chief diversity officer who is going to lead the charge I mean she is tasked with keeping us focused and to be rolling out all of these um, programs that you know we have high expectations for so you know we're on a journey but it, it's not just on the companies or our organization to do this we all play a part in this you know and so we've got to uh, think about our words and communicating as we get out there and, and especially to the young children to support them when they want to you know when they're young trying to you know I don't know uh, use a power tool you know just encourage them and don't say give it to your brother you know have the girl show her how to do it let everybody you know be part of this because you know we we just can't we have a lot of opportunity out there and as you know we do a great job with filling them all in chief diversity officer i love that yeah uh, do you like that yeah i know yeah I um so we have um time there, i mean we could talk for hours, I think, all of us here. And, um, you know, I think I almost would love to get us all together for a round two of this. I think we have time for one more uh, response on that last question. So if there's anyone that wants to jump right in, that. Go ahead, Mary. Here. Yeah. Okay. I'm um, girls coming up through the ranks. I mean, they have to care about how things work. They have to be curious. They have to investigate opportunities. But in tech and tech real estate, you have to understand and want to know how things work. And so beyond math and science, it's also um, a passion that, all, that drives us all, how things work and how we can pro provide solutions. Because everybody on the call and likely everybody in the audience is, is involved in delivering solutions. And um, I feel real passionate about giving the opportunity, practicing inclusion, but also driving the passion because it's not all math and science. Sometimes it's just how, the, how all the puzzle pieces go together and how we can better serve our customers. Nice, okay. Well, thank you so much. Thanks so much to uh, everyone who's tuned in and to our panelists again, Mary Morgan, Lisa Williams, Christine Van Slyke, Mary T. Thank you. We'll do this again. It was fantastic. Um, and don't forget uh, for all of you viewers to come meet us in person November 11th and 12th at Telecom Exchange in LA and again May 12th and 13th in New York. You can find out more at thetelecomexchange.com. To feature your thought leader time on our monthly virtual CEO roundtable, you can email us at pr at jsa.net. Thank you so much for tuning in to JSA TV, the newsroom for tech and telecom professionals and JSA radio, your voice for tech and telecom. Until next time, happy networking. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.